visible on the recording, then perhaps turn your video off. But otherwise, we would love to see your shiny, smiley faces. Towards the end of the session, we're probably going to take a couple of screenshots to capture who was here today. So if you want to be in the photo, we'll give you a warning. You can put your video on just for that. Or if you don't want to be in the photo, feel free to leave your video off. So I'd like to give a big thanks to my team today. I've got Nathan, who's organising the IT. I've got Robin, who's doing the written harvest with help from Dee. We've got the wonderful Fiona, who's going to be doing a graphic harvest for us that we will share at the end of the session. So thanks to all the team. Right, so I'm just going to, we're very lucky because Steve managed to get hold of John McKnight yesterday morning. And if you guys don't know, he's one of the, I guess, the founders of the ABCD movement. He wrote the original kind of book about it and it's, D hasn't it grown today. So we're just going to go now to a video from John welcome, welcoming us to the conference because it's the first session of the whole conference. So Nathan, if I could just get you to share that, that'd be awesome. Thank you. Can everyone hear that? Because I haven't got sound at my end. Has anyone got sound? No. Okay. No sound. Shall I try to share mine then? Let's see if I can get it to work. Technology. Oh, yeah, technology. I know, right? Oh, I don't know where I've got it. Hang on. Ah, there we go. We'll just give this a go, and if we can't get it to work, we might have to post it up later for people to look at. Come on, John. Okay, that's looking like that's not going to work for us. So I might just have to stop that there. Sorry, guys. Never mind. Um, the whole talk from John is going to be up on the website later for you to check it out. He actually gives a really lovely overview of the ABCD movement, how it started and um, how it's grown and what a great movement it is as shown by this amazing conference that we're putting on today. So just a brief summary from me for those of you don't, that don't know, a huge thanks to Dee Brooks and Michelle Dunscombe who've really been the driving force between putting together this amazing free ABCD Unconference after COVID struck the world and closed everything down. Um, they decided we needed to get some stuff happening and they formed a group and in a very community led way have put together a whole conference based entirely on their own and others efforts and energy. And we're really excited to be part of it. It's going to be very amazing. I can't believe we've got over 42 sessions over 48 hours, you know, 18 countries. It's going to be super. So a uh, very big welcome to everyone to, to the conference. So anyway, moving on to our session today, Pandemic Pivot. Um, so I don't know what happened in all your different countries, but I know in New Zealand it was pretty major and pretty sudden and quite scary in a way. So I guess from the beginning of March, obviously things were heating up and there were cases of COVID coming in and New Zealand still didn't have a lot of cases. We're lucky that we're an island and I guess quite isolated. So. There wasn't too much happening. But on Monday, the 23rd of March at 1pm, New Zealand went very suddenly into alert level three, which is our third highest level out of four levels. And within 48 hours, we were at alert level four, which was a complete lockdown. And I mean complete. No takeaways, you know, no restaurants or cafes open. All that was open were like doctors, supermarkets, and you're only allowed out one person to go to the supermarket and you could exercise in your local area. So it happened very, very quickly. 
Um, so what we wanted to look at in this session was, you know, how, how did that, what challenges did, did that bring working with our communities? We just had so little time to, to get organised. But also with the challenges, obviously there's opportunities and perhaps there are some lessons as well, something we might take away from what we had to do during the lockdown that maybe is even a better way of working, an improvement to our practice. So I'm really pleased today to have three wonderful organisations joining us from all across our Teodoro, very diverse. Um, firstly, we have Alan, who's coming to us from Katikati, Kati, which is in um, near um, the town of Taronga in the Bay of Plenty. It's quite a small town. And Alan will correct me if I'm wrong. I've done a little bit of research. Only 5,000 people. Is that about right? So it's, so it's pretty small. And Alan is the um, centre manager for the community centre there, which is really at the heart of the community. So he's going to be our first speaker to share um, what they did during the lockdown. Uh, second, we have Jessica and Marie coming to us from um, Ramwick Park. There they are giving a wave from the, um, which is a suburb in the south of Auckland. It's a very urban area. It's a very low socioeconomic area. It has a very high Maori and Pacifica population and also a really strong community spirit that they'll share the history of that with you. And I think you will see from their presentation how having that strong community and those relationships before the lockdown has just made it an amazing springboard for them to support each other during the challenges of COVID. And finally, we're going to have Shiv joining us from Tamao Poko, which is another community-led development organisation. It supports four quite small settlement communities along the Whanganui River, and it's very closely connected to and supported by their local Maori, their Maori iwi, their tribe. So they're our three panellists that we've got today. So I'm going to kick off the session with Alan. So I'll hand it to you, Alan, if you could um, share your screen. If you want to see him up close, you can hit the speaker view button at the top. <laughs> we can stay in gallery view and I'll hand to you now, Alan. Don't forget to put questions in the check-in if you have them. Thanks, Alan. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you for the intro. Uh, Atamarie, good morning, everybody from all around the world and, and in New Zealand. Um, uh, as Joanne said, I'm the centre manager for the Kari Kari Community Centre. Um, so for those of you um, who not, don't live in New Zealand, um, Kari Kari is uh, approximately two hours southeast of Auckland. Um, we're a small rural town um, known as the avocado capital of New Zealand. Um, we've also got a lot, of, a lot of murals around town. If you see that behind me, we've got a lot of artwork that's popped up around town, um, which is neat. Um, to give you an idea of the demographics, so about 38-39% of our population would be over 65. So as you can imagine, during uh, COVID and the lockdown, you know, we had a high proportion of uh, vulnerable that were in our community that we um, needed to support. Uh, so here at the community centre, we are, I guess you could call us a bit of a social service hub of the community. Um, we run adult community education classes. We have um, information and advice for the community. We run youth programs. Uh, we also have um, um, a various other sort of programs that we offer rooms for rent, etc., for for our community. So we've been we've been servicing our community for about 27 years now, which is fantastic. So today, um, my presentation, I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, the community centre involvement um, pre, during and post uh, COVID lockdown um, and tell you a little bit sort of how we went about um, supporting our community during this, um, you know, presidential time. So I'll be talking a little bit like that. So I'll get underway. Uh, so on Monday, the 23rd of March, uh, the government announced that we were entering into alert level three. Not long after, I received a call from Jackie Knight from Catch Caddy Caddy. Catch Caddy Caddy are, I guess, they're the events, um, events and business uh, organisation of Caddy Caddy, and we work quite closely together. Uh, and she suggested we have a meeting with all our local community groups to determine who would be operating during Level 3. We proceeded to touch base with some of the key groups that we've, um, that we've been working with in our community um, through our Strengthening Communities program, which is like a networking uh, meeting that we have bi-monthly and it's you know using those strong connections that we've already had. Um, I did know that there were some necessary groups um, that were not represented on that strengthening community database so we engaged with a local volunteer Kay Robinson from a, um, our community development group Katie Katie Tayo who offered to volunteer a few hours of her time to start constructing a bit more of a solid database of vital organisations we need to Connect with through this pandemic. Um, so this was still when we were allowed to operate before we were actually in um, lockdown and we couldn't have our um, premises open. 
So we agreed to we agreed to host this meeting down at Catch Caddy Caddy um, the following day or the following Tuesday, and not long after we found out that we could not have any group gatherings at all, so we couldn't actually have any um, physical face to face meetings. So we had to shift our thinking. How can we connect with our local organisations to support our community during this pandemic? Uh, we had uh, Jenny Hobbs, who um, at the time was the chair of Caddy Caddy Tai, um, the the group um, community development group. Who, um, who offered to use the Zoom account because they had a Zoom subscription to facilitate the meetings that we're intending to have in person. Um, our first COVID response group meeting was subsequently held on the following Tuesday at 9 a.m., um, which I um, did. We agreed the purpose of these meetings was to retain a strong collective network and determine how we can best support our most vulnerable in the community, which so happens to be the majority of the senior community. The meetings were, um, we agreed to have the meetings to be held each Tuesday and Friday at 9 a.m., followed by a distribution of the Zoom chat log, which we used, which acted as minutes of sorts. So there was quite a bit of learning how to Zoom, I guess, as we all have learned over this pandemic. Zoom has become, I guess, a bit of a critical tool for communicating. So it didn't take long before everyone got up to speak, like muting and things like that, so there weren't too many distractions. Um, on the afternoon of Tuesday, the 24th of March, the government announced the nationwide lockdown, which would come into effect at 11.59 p.m. on Wednesday, the 25th of March. The community centre team urgently met to determine the process of working through the lockdown and what our key priorities will be. The Katakata Community Centre thankfully had a, um, a, a huge investment in IT infrastructure back in 2019. Um, prior, to, prior to that, a lot of the work we did in the community centre was all pen and paper, writing things in diaries. It was um, not at all um, anything in the cloud or anything like that. So it was invaluable that we had this technology that allowed us to continue working from home while regularly staying connected with each other online. Um, our phone lines were also upgraded to VoIP um, six months prior to COVID, and this allowed us to retain our phone lines being open so our community can continue to connect and find out important information regarding COVID and any services that were still operating. We took, also took a proactive approach with contacting our database of senior residents on a weekly basis to have a sort of a check in and provide a friendly voice to talk to. Um, there are a um, uh, large number of seniors that are in isolation, that are living at home alone, so it was important to have that continue, uh, that continued chat just to reassure them and provide any information um, as you know, it was coming through, it was coming through thick and fast. Uh, it was humbling to have so many people in our community um, call the community centre, putting their hand up, offering to help. We began gathering a list of names of all our volunteer helpers and started up a bit of a buddy system of sorts. We would link buddies with residents in our community who required um, the delivery of groceries and on occasion a friendly person to talk to. Um, and we've got one supermarket in Caddy Caddy and um, they were overrun um, with online, online deliveries. Um, and often, and residents, anyone over 70 actually couldn't go into the supermarket. So getting groceries was a really important um, aspect to supporting a, a vulnerable in the community. And I'll go into that in a bit more detail later. Uh, participation in the COVID response group meetings began attracting momentum. And we got up to about 28 participants attending in one meeting. And this, is, this was 28 participants, not just in Caddy Caddy, but there were also social agencies in Tauranga, um, which is 30 minutes away from Caddy Caddy, who are also um, involved who support the Western Bay of Plenty. Consequently, the popularity of this group meant we risked spending more time um, talking than doing, or more, more who, um, less more who and less doing. Um, who we mean more meetings and less, less doing things. So I requested we only have one representative from each organisation attend while aiming for a meeting duration of about an hour. Because we wanted to be more proactive, we wanted to be active in our community rather than just continue talking about things that are happening. Once our COVID response group was well established, we began to develop a more structured form of support for our community, from sourcing group volunteers to get involved with Red Cross to deliver Meals on Wheels. Um, so Meals on Wheels um, is, we have Lexham Park, which is a retirement uh, village, I guess you could call it, um, that makes um, affordable meals um, for um, the seniors in our community and um, that, that gets delivered to um, people, uh, those, those residents' homes. Um, the existing volunteers who were doing this prior to COVID lockdown were all over 70. So effectively that whole volunteer workforce was gone. So we had to source a whole lot of new volunteers under the age of 70 to um, conduct those deliveries for those residents that needed it. 
We also set up a grocery delivery service in partnership with Catch Caddy Caddy, who are the um, events um, organization I talked about earlier, Red Cross, Caddy Caddy Tire, and the Countdown Supermarket to support Countdown's oversubscribed service of online um, deliveries. And also um, we, we rallied together and managed to get donated warm clothing to our local um, REC workers. So REC workers are um, um, workers that come from the islands who come over and help pick kiwi fruit, pruning, etc. Um, and we're also advocating for the Caddy Caddy advertiser to be circulated again. The Caddy Caddy advertiser is, um, I guess it's a local newspaper and a lot of other communities online has become the, you know, the key source of information. But our, our community still relies heavily on that local newspaper as a form of um, local information, what's going on in the community. So without that advertiser, it was very difficult uh, getting information out to our community because um, we um, it was only really based on phone lines relying on people to call us. So we um, we advocated for that to get delivered again. It could be delivered rurally, but not in the urban town centre. But it could be it was distributed to the likes of the countdown supermarket and other key areas where people could pick up. The grocery delivery service was especially appreciated by our local residents, with regular deliveries going out to approximately 24 residents in our community. Um, I'm going to share a little bit of feedback on um, what one of, our, uh, one of our residents actually had to say about this service. Good morning, Alan. Uh, thank you so much for the food delivery this morning. I was not expecting it until this afternoon. To my surprise, a Red Cross relief van pulled into my drive quite early. My heart stopped. What has gone wrong? Then I realised it was my groceries. I felt excited and yet humbled that here I was having people come to serve me. A very pleasant young man was the deliverer and even better was the fact that Jenny Hobbs was there as well, being her usual, usual cherry self. Only one item was missing, which I thought probably would be the crushed garlic. And packing was like del delving into a Christmas stocking. It was, a fun checking, it was fun checking off my list. It was odd, however, having to keep my distance when the usual instinct would be to give a hug, etc. Thank you so much. These are strange times and yet opportunities are there for learning some valuable lessons. Blessings and thank you, and I hope others will get the same joy as I did this morning as they receive their parcels. I guess for some, it will be a relief as well. Kind regards, Maggie Jack. So that was just yeah, one of, we had multiple um, other um, comments, feedback from our community, how valuable that service was. And it was, it would cut out a lot of the red tape of having residents having to try and order online through Countdown. They could just easily ring the community center um, get an order, we would send that order to the Red Cross um, grocery packer and then the Red Cross um, relief van would go out and deliver these groceries and there was a uh, FPOS machine that they could just use the FPOS card and um, pay for the groceries. So we wanted to reduce as many barriers as possible for people getting the groceries. Our rapid response to the needs of the community was a result of all the right organisations connecting with each other to achieve one common purpose and that was supporting our most vulnerable in the community. And it's, it's been highlighted that, you know, we've had others ask us, you know, how did you get things done so quickly and, ha and how did you, you know, have such a rapid response? And it was, it was simply that. It was communication and relationships. We had those existing relationships um, in our community that we could tap into and feed into. Uh, and we also effectively and regularly communicated um, with each other, communicating the key areas that needed to be addressed. And if something was, if there was an issue, someone was there just to go out and get it, get it sorted within the restrictions that were in place, of course, through COVID. Through the period of the lockdown, information was coming through thick and fast. To collate all this information together, I started a COVID response group newsletter, which acted as one collective source of information from key providers, which was circulated to the group on a weekly basis. The newsletter will continue to be circulated on a monthly basis, highlighting key activities of community groups and possible areas of collaboration. So that was one of the key learnings that we want to carry on uh, into this post-COVID world is sharing sharing information to other community groups of what's going on um, with each other and breaking down any potential silos that happen in our community so we can continue to share, continue to look for areas of collaboration and support one another to enable us to enrich our, enrich our uh, local community. When the government announced the move into level three on 11.59, PM on the 27th of April, our core focus began to shift from immediate response to recovery. Front of mind was how we work towards supporting our local businesses who have been severely impacted by not receiving any income. 
So the local Rotary stepped in to offer business mentoring service in partnership with um, our local um, business mentor, who is, who is a volunteer business mentor at the community centre. And unfortunately, there had not been much uptake in this mentoring. However, I foresee there's been a valuable service that we're going to continue to offer for our local businesses here in Caddy Caddy. And we don't think there was a big uptake because, you know, everyone had, you know, how we're going to survive and mentoring probably wasn't on the front of mind, even though it could have been quite a valuable service for businesses to uh, talk through with, with the experienced mentor. Um, so as we mo move into a post-COVID world, the community centre will be taking three key learnings from this experience and focusing on three key priority areas. Number one is progressive investment in key technologies to allow groups to conduct quality video conferencing from the community centre, making meetings more accessible, saving time on travel and reducing carbon emissions. So post-COVID, we were thankfully we got some, thank you to the Western Bay Community Council, we got some funding to allow us to get free big screen TVs for three of our main rooms that we rent out here in the community centre, along with some video conferencing software. And that's gonna allow us to continue doing a hybrid type approach with meetings. So people can come into the meetings, but we can also have people um, link in through Zoom or any other online platform. Um, so they don't have to, so they can save time traveling to the community centre, particularly because we get a lot of people come from Tauranga, um, which is a 30 minute drive. And that road, that stretch of road between Tauranga and Caddy Caddy is quite a dangerous road. Um, unfortunately, there's been a lot of accidents. It's, it's a growing area where we live in, um, rapidly growing, and there's just more and more traffic on that road. So, you know, it's a lot safer for people to be able to zoom and come in. We're reducing carbon emissions through people not hopping in their car and traveling out to meet at the community center, and it's just more efficient. So we're looking forward to that um, when that's gonna be installed. Um, we're also going to be, we're working, or we're actually launching this week, it's um, New Zealand Volunteer Week this week, and we're going to be um, launching a volunteer brokerage service, which promotes volunteering activities in Caddy Caddy and links people's interests with appropriate organisations. It was clearly obvious to us um, that the majority of our volunteer base in Caddy Caddy is over 65, and we would like to make volunteering, um, I guess, more accessible and reducing barriers for, you know, people of all ages to get into volunteering. And that's things like micro volunteering. So we're going to have a calendar on our website that shows different volunteering activities um, that happen in our community. If they've only got limited time, say, to volunteer and can't have that commitment because of families and work commitments, etc. And also, um, particularly because we're getting a lot of new people moving into the community, um, primarily from Auckland. Um, and then we can say, you know, a lot of them want to meet people. They want they've got experience. They want to give their time. So we can be that brokerage that link to volunteer organisations to support them um, with volunteers. We have approximately between 80 to 100 volunteer groups in Caddy Caddy. So however we can support them with people and resource, um, again, that's just another way we can support and enrich our community. Um, and number three, we're gonna to continue to connect and collaborate with those organisations who are involved with COVID, the COVID response group um, under, under our strengthening communities umbrella. It will be, a challenge, I guess, keeping everyone as well connected as we did during COVID because we were all working for that one common purpose and people weren't, you know, focused, I guess, on anything else within the organisations. But, you know, as I mentioned earlier with our um, hybrid type meetings, making it more accessible for people to meet, we're hoping we can continue those uh, rich connections that we um, had over COVID and use those connections to continue um, collaborating and um, enriching our community. Um, so that was um, a bit of a, um, a bit of a sort of an update from the Caddy Caddy community side around COVID. I'm going to just share my screen with you um, and show you um, just a quick picture of um, um, just a couple of pictures of, of the residents receiving um, groceries. So I'm just going to bring that up now. One second. Okay, so I'm about to share my screen now. So Joanna, if you can nod your head, if you see that. Yep, cool, so that, just to tell you some of these pictures, so up in the top left-hand corner, we've got our um, RAC workers, um, that's receiving donated clothing. Um, so they were very heavily involved, as I mentioned earlier, picking 
kiwi fruit and supporting our rich horticultural um, industry here in Kati Kati. Um, up on the top right hand corner we've got Thor, a Red Cross volunteer and Ken Allen, one of our local senior residents receiving groceries. Down on the bottom left, that's Maggie Jack, who I read um, some of her feedback earlier on. She's very delighted receiving groceries. And we have Leanne, another senior resident, um, also receiving um, groceries down there. So that's just a little bit of a, I guess, give a snapshot of um, some of the, uh, the highlights of um, the services that we're doing. So yeah, so that's, that's um, my presentation. So thank you everybody for listening. Thanks so much, Alan. I am actually going to um, take a few questions, if that's okay. I just had a quick question. I don't know who feels qualified to answer this, but someone's just noticed that there were no masks in your photos. And I think maybe that's been a bit of a different experience in New Zealand to elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Did you have much of a discussion around masks in your community? Uh, yes, we did. And because we always followed the guidance from the Ministry of Health um, and they never actually, you know, they said masks, you know, there was always discussion, masks or not masks, and the Ministry of Health never recommended it. We did have them for anyone that wanted to wear them and um, we had that available, but we, apart from when um, we were doing the grocery shopping, so our grocery shop actually was wearing a mask um, in the countdown, but aside from that, they were, in our community anyway, they were not actually that common, and, and primarily because it wasn't actually recommended by the Ministry of Health. Mm, cool. Um, I also wondered if you'd be able to talk a little bit about the amazing poster that's behind you, because I think that relates to community work, doesn't it? Of course. So, uh, well, this poster was actually completed, well, a mural, I guess, is um, completed about well, four years ago. So a lot of our kids in our after-school care program, they came to this, I guess, harvest is a word that we're using at the moment, isn't it? Of, um, different, um, um, different, you know, animals and flora and fauna here in um, Kati Kati. So they're just, it was like a nature painting and stuff. So you've got your butterflies and flowers and things, so it's quite a, quite a rich, um, rich history of um, yeah, art, I guess, from the kids. Oh, that's so cool. Um, Hannah, I know you had a question. Do you, do you want to unmute and ask your question for Alan? Yeah, um, I hope you can hear me. Uh, yes. Thanks, Alan. It's really interesting. I won't turn my video on. My Wi-Fi is a bit slow, but um, I'm just wondering, was there something that you can point out specifically in what motivated the community to mobilize? Was it COVID in general or was there a specific aspect of there was a vulnerable part of the community that needed the more active part of the community to come together? Like, was there anything more nuanced than just COVID itself? Um, I guess COVID was the catalyst. And um, because we had those strong rich connections, we knew, because we know our community relatively well, we knew that there were going to be a lot of vulnerable based on, you know, the information that was coming through COVID, you know, people being in lockdown, we already knew there were people in our community that were in isolation. So COVID was really the catalyst for us to quickly um, find out how we can connect and how we can collaborate to support our community. And there were other, other than our senior residents, other um, we were, things that we were supporting from helping families, um, you know, we were, we were having some people sleeping rough in the community. So the local church group were um, supporting, um, supporting those people. We also had food deliveries from the food bank that we were supporting out to, out to communities. So yeah, COVID was the catalyst to us coming together really. Cool. Uh, Johanna, you had a question as well? Are you able to? Yep, Thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot for the insightful talk. I wanted to find out how did you manage uh, social distancing? Oh, yes. No, thanks, Joanna. Um, so we, when we were in lockdown, I guess we, um, there were, there, we had different roles. So my role, I was behind the scenes coordinating the, the group. So I was locked in at home and I was just making sure everyone kept connected and everything. And then we had our essential workers who um, the government allowed essential workers who are on the front line supporting, I guess, um, key work. So they, we had a, it was a two metre distancing rule. So when they were out giving groceries or in the countdown supermarkets, you had to maintain that two metre social distancing. So we made that very clear to our volunteers who were helping, you know, if you're an essential worker out there supporting our community, you know, there's a two metre distancing, they, had, they were wearing gloves, and then when they were in the supermarket had the mask. So it was very much trust that they did that, but we were confident that they were maintaining that social distancing. Great. Um, 
great. Thanks very much. Um, there'll be some more time for questions at the end, I think, but now we're going to go to our second presenters. So thank you, Alan. <laughs> and um, I'll just get Jessica and Marie to unmute and share their stories of Ramwick Park. I think you guys have some slides to share as well. So if one of you would like to share your screen. Marie. Marie, Jess is saying, Marie, please share your screen. I'm coming. I'm coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so perhaps while Marie's doing that, Jess, you could just start giving us the, the lowdown on Ramwick Park community. Oh, kia ora koutou, tailo falava. I'm Jessica Goshi. I'm one half of the community-led development team with my amazing teammate, Marie. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you are Wonder Woman, I must admit. Um, and so we're going to kind of tag team through our presentation. Oh, here we go. The slides are coming up. So we um, do the community development in a suburb called Ramwick Park, which is the eastern part of a much bigger suburb, um, Manirewa, which is in South Auckland, New Zealand, and Auckland's the biggest city. So for comparison, our suburb population is the same as Kati Kati. <laughs> Um, which is quite interesting, I didn't know that. We have a population of 6,300 and our, our community is in really diverse. Um, one third of our locals are actually aged under 15, so it's a youthful population. We have um, 2.3, um, so 2,300 who identifies Pacifica, Pacific Island, Polynesian, um, I'm not sure what language people are familiar from overseas. There's people who um, have ties to the Pacific Islands and the Pacific Ocean. Um, Māori, our Indigenous peoples, we have 1,700 in um, Ramat Park. In Asian, which might include Indian, we have a strong Sikh Indian community. And then um, European, we have 1,300. So, um, it's incredibly diverse. We have it's predominantly low socioeconomic um, people living in poverty, but we also have um, pockets of our suburb where the uh, people who aren't. So we're dealing with an incredibly diverse community. Um, so what we've um, experienced over time. So I've only been working in. Ramwick Park for nearly two years. Marie's a local resident of 16 years, so she brings that wealth and experience to our team. And she will tell you a brief history of how we've um, come to where we are today and how we're able to work the way we do in Ramwick Park. Marie? Kia ora koutou everyone, um, welcome. And um, welcome to New Zealand, <laughs> in a sense. Um, I just want to tell you a little bit um, my journey started in Ranwick Park. We moved here, um, as Jess said, 16 years ago. And in 2008, there was um, a fatal shooting. And I hate starting with that because it, it really, it's not a great start to a story, but it really is a catalyst for some pretty massive change. And so we had a um, liquor store shooting, and unfortunately, the, um, the guy died during it. But what it did for the community is the community said, we don't want to be known by this. We, we don't want to be known by being this kind of community. And so community got together and they did a candlelit vigil at, um, outside the liquor store. I think most of Ramwick Park turned up and we walked, it's, it's actually, as you can see, it's in a block and we walked right around the, right around the perimeter. It was really cool and it, it brought everyone together. And so from then on, we ended up making these positive changes. It was about making, I guess, changing the narrative to what people had known. And so we ended up having some events. We ended up, um, just the locals got together and made our neighbourhood a better place, which it sounds so easy, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> but we changed the spaces and we were asked by a local council member at the time, if, if money was no issue, what would you do here? <laughs> it's like, wow, 
that is, you know, that's huge. And so we said, well, what we actually need is some things for our kids to do. We need um, a place to gather. We need a village because we're placed, we're sort of isolated. We're over the motorway bridge. We're isolated. And we've got four little shops. <laughs> and, and sometimes those shops aren't so, <laughs> so wonderful. And so we didn't have an awful lot. So we said what we need is a, a village, a, a community feel. And so we worked with local council and in 2014, we opened our new skate park, which is designed by local skaters from opposing gangs and groups that got together because they had this um, mutual, I guess, love of skating. So they got together and they designed it. And it's amazing. It's one of the um, top three in Auckland and people come out to it all the time. So then we've... Then in 2016, as part of that project, we had Manu Tukutuku, which opened, and that's a community centre. It's beautiful. Um, they tried to give us a glass one at first, and we all went, really? <laughs> Do you know what kind of people live here? <laughs> Honestly, it'll be, it'll be shattered in no time. So we asked them to take it back to the architects, and we had our voice and said, actually, what we want is something solid, but something that we can love, something that's beautiful, but solid. <laughs> so because of all the work that we had done since 2008, in 2017, we were actually named New Zealand's um, Maida 10 Community of the Year, which we were so privileged uh, to be at. We, we actually took, we were allowed to at the, at the, um, celebration we took 30 um, <laughs> because it was the whole community that did it and um, and so we took it and uh, the guys got up and did a hucker on the stage live on TV as you do so um, we've come from that sort of area but after we became the community of the year we were we were looking into how we could do more and where we could get finances and stuff like that from. And it, we discovered that there was a partnership that we could have with the Department of Internal Affairs. And so we put in to be one of those and uh, we were accepted. And so since uh, 2018, we've been one of their partners and it just allows us to really work in that community led space which is fantastic. It really gives us the freedom to work with people and to get things done. So I'm going to hand back to Jess and she's going to talk about what it was like pre-COVID. Thanks, Murray. Um, so on the next slide, is it? Yeah, here we go. Um, so as I mentioned before, I'm two years in this role. We're, we're in our third year of our partnership with Department of Internal Affairs. We refer to them as DIA. Um, in short, and what that has allowed us to do is um, it's largely allowed us access to resources to, to gather really important information from our community. So we were able to um, talk to over 400 households and identify what our community wanted so that we could get in and support to make these things happen. So in the middle of that slide, you'll see um, Marie standing by a poster and that's our community plan and that has been put together solely upon the voice of our community that um, this is what we want to happen in our community and the overwhelming um, the overwhelming thing that our community wants is connection and to feel safe and so um, we've done a lot of things in, um, to make those things happen and it's all done by working with community so it's led by community. So we've had um, so many things happen in the time we've been here. Um, you'll see there's a poster about Matariki, which was, is going to be coming up about now. Matariki roughly translates to Māori New Year. So it's the time when you do new harvesting and, and new growth and new beginnings. And so annually we have hosted a kite day and that's included having market stalls and massive petting zoo which is huge for our kids who probably most haven't even been to a farm 
So to be able to interact with animals in that way, face painting, which was done by one of our um, local residents, and, and you know that came about through having a chat with him. She goes, oh, I do face painting. So we did that, and that saved us some money for, <laughs> instead of having to pay hundreds to get outside people in. Um, we had um, this amazing program, which started at the end of last year. We piloted in partnership with BBM, Brown Butterbean Motivation, which is headed by this incredibly charismatic, passionate man who um, delivers boot camps and also addresses mental health issues. And he comes from a place of lived experience. And the whole co-papa or philosophy of BBM is to build family. And so everyone comes and joins, everyone exercises, and that's the vehicle to get the conversation to build support and, and work towards change in, in health and nutrition and, and in a really holistic sense. And alongside that, we were able to have them um, teach kapahaka, um, when someone do the translation for that, um, kapahaka, and Pacifica dance seva, Samoan seva dancers. So it was another way for people to connect with our cultural roots, which for many have become disconnected. Um, so we had that going. Um, we've hosted many different craft sessions, including making high tea plates, which is Marie's specialty. Um, and we, were, we had a whole series of street barbecues ready to start in March. But um, we suddenly had to stop and pivot and reassess how we were going to do all this stuff because, as everyone's explained, we went rapidly into lockdown because of this COVID-19 pandemic. So we had to, <laughs> we, we really had to stop and go, actually, how do we keep working? How do we keep doing our CRD stuff and, and maintain connection, maintain that community feel, maintain those relationships? That, um, our community really treasures and it was a real stop and think from um, Marie lives there but I'm half an hour away so how do I do this from my house and um, and support things and in true Ramwick Park style <laughs> our community kicked in and did it themselves and so as you can see on the right there's this amazing graphic that Marie created which is our our tree so we Talk about our orchard and our in our community and how we grow our trees and and grow at the strength of our community and so it's a bit hard to see kind of there but the the leaves and the fruit are all the things that um that grew in response to the COVID-19 pandemic and so Marie and I are going to um it was hard to choose which ones to talk about because they all have really powerful stories and connection behind it but um Marie and I are now going to talk about a few of them um, just to highlight what our community came together and did. So, Marie, do you want to do the next one? Cool. Um, I don't know about um, you, Ellen. I, I like when you were sharing about all the different things that were kind of going on, but we, um, we looked and everyone looked like they were doing things in isolation, but actually they were all crossing over each other and they were all doing stuff together without really realising it. And so our tree really does show a little bit of of you know everyone's doing something whether it be big or small whether it be um planned or not planned it, it just kind of happens so um let's have a look at a couple of things that happened just to give you an idea during lockdown so um the first thing we're going to talk about is um our street by street facebook pages uh normally you'd have a neighborhood watch sort of thing going on in your street and so that would have been the perfect way to get to know your neighbours and um, to keep in touch with them, to know what was happening. And we thought, well, you know, that's a good idea. But um, unfortunately, a lot of our people just hadn't signed up. They weren't really interested in joining an organisation as such. But what we did discover is we had one face, we had our main Facebook page for Ranwick Park, and then we had one street that had started a little Facebook page and they'd started doing some quite cool things. They'd let people know of, um, of things that were happening in the street. They were sharing furniture. They were, they were doing all sorts of bits and pieces. And so that we were just watching. We were observing from way back, <laughs> just watching to see what would happen with that. Now, when 
lockdown finally happened, we looked at that and said, you know, asset base, this is what we've already got. Let's see what we can come up with. So one of the locals came and he knew about this Facebook page and he said, let's do that. Let's do it all over the place. Fortunately, because we're partners with Department of Internal Affairs, we were able to really quickly get this moving. We had we had funding available and in fact Jessica and I had just applied for some engagement budget which in hindsight was a good idea Jess um, <laughs> because that's, that's what actually got us going it's, it was available right there and then just to help um, the girl that you can see turned 21 during lockdown um, which we all had invites to her birthday party but they were all <laughs> then we didn't <laughs> And so she was actually staying uh, with the locals that wanted to do the Facebook pages. She was staying with them for lockdown. And so they created a, a small job for her, just putting things together. Now she works with the youth already. So she was able to start off. The first thing she did was colouring competition. So you can see that up in the corner. She did colouring competitions, she gave away chocolate, <laughs> she did all sorts of things, non-contact, uh, it was all done through letterboxes and uh, just passing those kind of things on. At the bottom, you can see she gave out um, chalk and one of our local residents, we discovered, is quite the artist. <laughs> and so it all came out and she started to draw on her neighbor's fence because she lives up a right of way. So she decorated his whole fence, which he loved. And there were just messages and they started to go out and it just made everyone feel, I think, a bit safer and a bit more involved in what was going on. They got in, they got in contact with the local um, Māori Marae and they had hand sanitizer and toilet paper and gloves and cleaning products and all sorts of things and they'd put all those together and so they literally jam-packed a van and went around and started giving them out. I think at this stage um, by the end of lockdown they had eight streets that were on Facebook and connecting with each other. They're now carrying on and trying to get half of Randwick, <laughs> actually, especially the ones who um, are in the more impoverished areas, trying to get them connected. And it's starting to bring up some really cool stuff. And we're really excited about what this is going to mean. We, we still have the barbecue and <laughs> all the stuff that we had for the barbecues before. So as things start to unlock for us, we're now currently in Alert Level 1, which um, is pretty free apart from our borders. And so we're planning on getting just the small neighbors, neighborhood groups together and having those barbecues. So that was a real success. We were, we were really stoked with what they did. And uh, there were a few articles and things that were written about it because it was so much fun. I think, I think people need good news in a time like this and um, they, they definitely provided us with some good news stories. Yes. Okay, so um, the other one of the bigger collaborations that came up was um, the face mask project um, or hygiene, personal hygiene packs. And so um, our local community house manager and Another, another act of trust in our community um, approached us with their idea. Well, it was actually well, it was into action by that stage. They moved pretty quickly. Um, and so there was a lot of anxiety because it's interesting the mask thing came up earlier because as um, Alan said, there was kind of, it was 50-50 either way as to where, whether we were wearing masks. But what was noticed was a lot of people were using um, scarves or pieces of material or things um, to cover their face to feel safer in the supermarket. And we had, um, as many are aware, hand sanitizer became very difficult to um, get your hands on, so to speak. Um, disposable gloves, disposable masks, they were 
you know, really scarce. So um, these amazing women put together an idea to sew face masks in, a, in accompanying that um, was information about how to use it safely, wash them, etc., that kind of thing. And so these incredible women ended up collab collaborating, getting so many people on board. So in, in total, there were 15 um, organisations and groups of people who came together to put these hygiene packs. So the, the um, face masks were sewn using donated fabric. Um, and also in the packs, as you'll see in the, in the pictures there, there was um, recipe information because people were wanting to know, you know, how do we, um, because we're dealing with low-income families, how do we make our food stretch? How do we cook things up? We had um, information sheets, which Marie and I um, put together through tapping into our local networks. I'm on the local Manurewa community network, so I was getting the information flooding in, so we were able to filter that through and make sure people could access food banks, could access the um, immediate services, the essential services that were operating um, to support them through this really trying time. It also had hand sanitizer, bleach, disposable gloves, um, and as a result, so people applied to get a pack on Facebook, so 327 packs were distributed to Manirewa 100 in Ranwick. Um, each of those packs had two masks, I believe. Um, they were delivered via letterbox drops and um, community organisations helped get them out as well. Uh, there were 30, sorry, 36 households who were deemed high risk, so were someone aged over 65 or immune compromised from pre-existing health conditions. And through doing this, people filled out a short survey, so we were able to um, identify who needed further support. So that was meant that 75 households were getting additional support to help them through this time and into the future. Um, a further outcome from this project was um, an interest in how to harvest and grow your own food. So Talking Trash, one of the organisations here, um, really active educators in the waste management space, um, teaching how to compost, garden, grow fruit trees, really amazing active education around being, you know, much more environmentally conscious in our practices. So they were able to get a group of people who live close together to come together and build new friendships and support each other because they were particularly isolated. So there was all these amazing outcomes from it. Um, there were seven local people who sewed the masks. One of them was a single mother. And so because of um, being able to access our funding and other revenue streams, the women were actually able to be paid. And as a single mum, when you're going through it, it's hard enough as it is. So it meant that people had some income coming in who, you know, potentially had lost it or it was already really tough. So, because we really believe where we can and, and showing value in that way as well as we have our volunteer, volunteer stuff as well. So this, how this, was all woven together, it was absolutely incredible. And the response meant that people felt safer when they had to go to the supermarket or be out in public. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much the face mask project in a nutshell. Um, what's next, am I still doing this bit, Marie? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um. I just, I just wanted to tell a, a small story, um, really, because we looked at the tree and went, actually, this is, um, you know, it, not everything that happened was big, uh, but it often had a big impact. And the Easter Bunny story was an interesting one. We had Steve Farrelly, who runs our local breakfast club at the school, and he gets all sorts of things from from supermarkets. I don't know how he gets it all, but he manages to get all sorts of crazy things. And because of lockdown, of course, it was, there just were uh, chocolate Easter eggs and things like that, which people weren't really buying. They were buying what was essential. And so they were going and, and getting their supermarket things. But what happened this day was Steve dropped off a box full of Easter, chocolate Easter bunnies to 
um, Anne-Marie, who's our local high school youth worker, and they've been doing things together for, for years. And so he dropped them off to her and she was so excited. She dressed up as the Easter Bunny and around Easter time she went around and started giving it out to the children. And one of the stories that we got back uh, was that there was a lady who had gone down to the local dairy. We, we have a, the supermarket is a ride away. So we, she was down at the local dairy and she was getting a few things for her children and grandchildren. And Anne-Marie happened to be up there and gave her uh, some Easter bunnies for her children. And she was just totally blown away that someone would take the time to do something just really special at that time where it felt like people were missing out. And so even though it was a bit of chocolate, actually it was a huge amount of joy that came with that chocolate. And it spread just some really cool vibes around the around the community and it, it just made things a bit more fun and uh, it was just cool because it's just what they had and so they used what they had. Yes. Um, yeah, another, so the ones we're talking about now are these like the, the really impactful things that seem quite small on the surface but really touch people's lives. And so um, Gawinda, who's the local alcohol store owner, he was involved with um, the New Zealand seat games, which were meant to be held, but obviously couldn't because we were in lockdown. So the seat community had all this food. So on a side note, this, um, we have a temple um, just near our area. And every week they were giving out vegetable packs to anyone who needed them. And then on top of that, <coughs> excuse me, I have a cold, um, the, uh, the food that Gawinda had, he was able to just get up a stand outside his shop because our local shops, bar one, were closed and, and just distribute the food, the, the healthy kai out um, to our Ramwick locals. And then alongside that, we were given some more hygiene packs from Manerewa Marae um, and they were given out alongside that. So, um, it was just incredible how many things came to us. And then on the, the right of that picture, you'll see this green fruit called Ajars. And these are like quite coveted in New Zealand. <laughs> it's only a short season, which happened to be during lockdown. So one of our friends of Ramwick, Dilly Stewart of Jericho Orchards, she had 200 kilos of the Fiji, which would have just gone to waste. And, um, and so she kindly touched base with Marie. Marie nipped up very safely, did the exchange, and then put the call out. Was it our Facebook page, Marie? Yeah. Yeah, through our Facebook page. She bagged them all up and then just left them at her little box for people to collect. So it's another thing, you know, which is a real, you know, felt like a treat. And so, and, and so Marie started getting feedback and wonderful stories about how appreciative it was to be able to have these VJOs and that, you know, we, it all came to us through our networks and through our relationships from outside Ramwick. Um, another organisation called The Generator, which supports um, people going into their own business and enterprise. And so I got the call from Tammy from The Generator. She goes, oh, I've got some veggie packs that I can give to you um, for Ramwick to support whanau who need it. So they delivered them to us and they were all donated by um, growers out where I live in Pukakoi and um, distributed out and that happened for a few weeks I believe and there were also some um, pre-prepared meals. So by having those strong relationships we actually some of our, our um, supports came to us which made our job a lot easier. Um, but it's all really re reciprocal so you all support each other and keep things going and so those relationships came to the fore um, in, in our response enabling Ramwick Park to be feel supported um, during the lockdown. So now Marie's going to wrap us up with <laughs> where to from here. We could keep telling these stories because they inspired us <laughs> and um, we could keep telling these stories. I've just done a bit more of a close-up so you can have a, a wee look at, at what we did. 
Um, this tree is a new concept for us and what we didn't want to do was to let COVID go by and go back to normal, <laughs> if you know what I mean. We wanted to take what we'd learnt, which was a lot. Uh, Jess and I would continually be learning things as we all sort of did. And so the tree now is, is sort of branching out. Ah, that was good. Um, <laughs> it's branching out into different parts of community. And we've got, we've got some community priorities that we want to do. And so we're looking at how can different organisations be part of those priorities, not just one organisation take over or take the lead on it, but actually that everyone's got something to, to contribute. So we're hoping that the next, uh, the next phase will be looking at how we can grow more of these um, trees, these, these CLD trees. Um, you'll notice that there are little birds and butterflies and bees. Those are the workers. <laughs> and just where we were able to really lightly touch some of these projects and just support them and help them in what they're doing. Um, our role is to support and to fill gaps where needed. And we, we're starting to roll into something quite exciting and quite different now. So. Uh, thanks for letting us share a little bit about what we're doing and um, I hope that you've enjoyed and been inspired by some of the things that our neighbours have done for their community. Thank you so much, Marie and Jess. Very inspiring and I think we've had so many comments in the chat about your beautiful tree that you created. It's so wonderful to see so many what you might call small fruit, but just as you said, I reckon it's the small things become the big things often. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm just going to ask you a couple of questions before we move on to our third speaker, Shiv. Um, we had a quick question around how, how did you get the funding for that initial build with the skate park and the sports ground, the community centre? Because obviously that was quite a big project. It was actually, um, we discovered, because we had a big green space in the middle of the community, and it had never been developed into anything. And as part of the housing development, people needed to put aside, the developers need to put aside um, a certain amount of money for green space and community spaces. And that had been used in other parts of South Auckland <laughs> instead of in Ranwick Park. And so uh, fortunately we had a city councillor who was so, um, on our side that he went and he discovered that this fund should have been spent in the area and so he invested it back into the community where it should have been spent and so um, big shout out to Daniel Newman and Angela Dalton they absolutely rock they support us and we were able to find different funding from different places mm. um, we have a playground in that space which is designed literally by the kids they made it out of pieces of cardboard and toilet rolls and and milk bottle lids and and everything i took down some uh creative packs to the school and had a competition and ended up with 28 models of playgrounds to choose from um <laughs> which was not easy but yeah, it's all it's all kind of because the community do it, the the local authorities get behind it and say, actually, you guys know what you want, let's get in there and do it. I know that doesn't always happen. I know we're very blessed to have those people, but yeah, that's how we got the funding for those. Great. And was it easy to get funding once you got that initial bit? I think once you can prove that you're doing good stuff with it, I think it it really does. If you can tell the stories, tell loads of stories about the things you're doing, because that's what encourages people to invest in you, I guess, and in your community. Cool, thank you. Um, and another question, what has COVID revealed about your community that you didn't know before? Did you all, did you suspect it was all there all along? <laughs> <laughs> um, I discovered that there are some wonderful people <laughs> as much as some of the stories of the people that cause um, 
a lot of trouble. There are actually some beautiful people that come out of the woodwork um, when they're really needed and we're now we're searching for those ones <laughs> and finding some more because we know that people want to connect and this was their opportunity and now we want to grow that. And also right. the, the positivity. So yeah. despite everyone being in, in really incredibly trying times, um, there was a, an overwhelming sense of, you know, we're in this together, um, really grateful for whatever happened and there was still, like in our social media and stuff, in our contacts, people were still really positive, including supporting each other. So one woman um, lost her partner during lockdown and her street came together, um, made sure they had food dropped off, cooked for them, all put together um, koha donations um, to help support with that process and they all had to do that um, with the tight restrictions on funerals, which was particularly different from a cultural perspective of how we grieve. So it was a Māori family. So um, just seeing people rally around people who are having an you know, incredibly tough times during incredibly tough times was really just, it was just hard. It just got you in the feels, man. <laughs> oh, that's so great. Those little stories are so great to share. Thank you so much. We're going to come across to Shiv now. I know there's been some really more great questions in the chat, but I think some of them would be great to put to the, all the panel. So I'm going to let Shiv go first. There's one about engaging private sector players, if you guys want to start thinking about how you might answer that. And we've had a bit of chat about, you know, the difference between, you know, trying to make this sort of thing work across a big city as opposed to small communities, which I think might be a good discussion for the breakout groups. So for now, we're going to move to Shiv from Tamal Poko, who's going to share her story of what they've been doing. All right, uh, kia ora everyone, kia ora tātou, whakalawalahiatu, good morning, wherever in the world or Aotearoa you happen to be. So unfortunately, um, my sidekick Darren was supposed to be here today, but he, um, he couldn't make it, so I've had to like wing it. But that's all right, because we're all about um, making it happen. So um, just to explain a little bit, I'm going to share my screen a little bit about um, our community. So we are the, where's that button? There it is. Tamaupoko community. So, um, oh, yep. We are a collection of four villages along the, the Wanganui River Road. So as you can see here, Wanganui is on the sort of the west coast of the, the North Island of New Zealand. So um, Tamaupoko is the tribal name that represents uh, four small villages which are um, Matahiwi, Ranana, Hiruharama, which is also known as Jerusalem, and um, Pipiriki. So each village has anywhere between around 30 and 70 residents with a total amount of around just over 200 people. Um, and our communities are spread over about 25 kilometres, which doesn't actually sound that far, but um, like a couple of other communities, I think it was Kati Kati, uh, the road is uh, it's windy. It's, um, it's a, it's, some people would call it a rough rural road, so you're um, surrounded by bush and, uh, and farmland. So in New Zealand terms, we are considered quite rural and isolated. We've still got power. Uh, most people have running water, or everyone has running water, but some people are uh, run their houses off, off rain water. Um, so yeah, rural and isolated. And it's uh, all our communities are predominantly Māori communities. So um, a little bit about the villages. So each village in Tamaupoko and along the Wanganui River Road has a marae. So for those of you who are on the the call who don't know what a marae is, it's the traditional epicenter of the village. So it's a communal building that belongs to the Māori people of the area. It has a large sleeping area, a large kitchen and a large communal and eating area. It has showers, toilets and running water. So every village has got this central point in it, which um, I'll tell you a little bit about later as well. Our nearest town is Wanganui, so it's on the west coast, so as I said before. It's about an hour into town on a car uh, driving that windy road. So um, 
the thing with our location is that it's not uncommon for our area to be cut off for up to weeks at a time in the colder and wetter months of the year. So after heavy periods of rain, often the hills on the side of the road will slip down onto the road, cutting off transport. And um, during these periods, it's also not uncommon to have power cuts and limited internet connectivity. So life can be pretty hard sometimes living rural, um, but you know we're resilient people and we always get through. About 95% of the families that live in Tamaupo for are Māori and have ancestral links to the land. They have a deep relationship with the whenua, the land, the ngāhere, the bush, and of course the awa, the river. We're used to living off the land, of being self-reliant, and are a people that are also very protective of the environment and the area. So um, just, that's a little bit like what it's like where we live. So, about three years ago, with the aid of some government funding, we established a community-led development program in that area. After a few name changes in the development of a trust, a community trust, we are now known as the TCLD Trust. Uh, and myself, I'm a trustee on that trust and have been on board since the beginning and helped to oversee and implement different projects and community development in our area. So I can honestly say that because of this community-led development program um, that was being run in our area, we were definitely in a better place coming into the COVID-19 lockdown uh, than had we not been set up the way we were. So we already had one central contact in each village whose job it was to help coordinate work that needed to be done and make contact. Uh, especially with those most vulnerable, including our elderly and disabled. One of the projects that I will talk about, because it's been interesting listening to uh, everyone's kōrero, everyone's um, discussions, because a lot of what has been happening with in all these different communities has been happening in Whanganui too, and it was probably happening uh, all, all over the world, I guess. Um, but I just wanted to, I think one of the things that sets us a little bit different is the fact that prior to the, the lockdown, we actually, it was actually about a year ago, we ran what was called a SKEMP project, which in SKEMP was a Settlement Community Emergency Management Plan. So this project that we run, it saw the commencement of written community emergency management plans, it saw um, people run, uh, attending civil defence emergency management courses alongside our council. Uh, we attended, had residents attend first aid courses. Uh, we had an increase of the emergency radios in each village. Um, and one little eye, we even had a civil defence cabinet put up. Oh, we might have lost a generator. So um, the generator for, so it was, we put it up in the, at Pipideki and essentially when Pipideki is, is cut off and there's no power or whatever, that the marae, the central place in, in that village will have power. So we know um, that people are still going to have power in one, uh, in one area in the village. So having this skimp in place, really put us ahead of the game. It wasn't things that we needed, to, we didn't need to worry about all these sorts of things come COVID-19, come lockdown. Uh, so I think we were in a pretty good place and it was due to the work that we'd already already done. So come lockdown, uh, as, I, as I said before, a lot of our people are quite protective of the area, so the actual, the first project that we got involved with was to help our residents get appropriate signage up along the river. So um, our chief executive went along to the council and had a chat with Iwi, and the discussion was, we do not want non-residents coming into the area because we have elderly and vulnerable uh, people. We don't want this, you know, we don't want this COVID-19 up the river. Um, so 
we need to keep people out. So thankfully we didn't have to resort to roadblocks as I know um, some rural communities did. Um, but yeah, that was the first sort of project that we that we got helped to get sorted. Um, now part of our, our trust team, our, our workers were located in town. So we had a group of us living up the river um, and, and a group already in town working. So. Thankfully, our chief executive was asked to attend some of the local iwi and government meetings that were being held, and uh, this meant that we had a voice at the table. Um, but it was really important to us that we didn't want to duplicate any work that was already being done on a larger scale. So initially, we were thinking, oh, yeah, look, let's get some food parcels out to our communities. Um, but through already established networks that I know a lot of you uh, were talking about before you've already got we found that uh, iwi were already looking at this they're already looking at the food parcels at the hand sanitizers and making sure people had what they needed so you know we decided it was better to um, support the work that was already being done uh, rather than duplicate it so we just yeah had a voice at the table and helped out where we could so through our community networks we were able to support the efforts to get residents access to basic immunisations and flu vaccines. So usually, uh, because of where we live, those services just don't come up the river, they don't come to us. But uh, you know, we always have to go to town, travel that hour and a, our 10 minute drive to go and get those. But the, the um, Māori iwi health provider, they came up and we just help, uh, helped coordinate those efforts. Um, much like you guys too, everybody else, kept up regular contact with all our residents. Most of the time it was over the phone, um, but we did have, uh, we've got a Facebook, um, a Facebook page and people sort of got on there as well. But making sure that all our residents were safe um, and they were you know, all right and had someone to talk to, especially our elderly, uh, and just having those check-ins was really important for us. Um, and so now that we've moved into recovery mode, we call it, um, we're looking to increase our resilience on the emergency management front. So yep, we are in a good place, but um, we're looking to increase the generators. So we want a generator at every village in the marae, uh, every marae in the village. Um, and uh, we've actually, we're, moving into creating our manaki plan. So manaki, uh, the me meaning of ma manaki is to support or take care of and to protect. So um, one of our speakers before was talking about um, the, you know, the gardens and the, the trees and the planting and things like that. So one of the things that all our people that COVID-19 has sort of brought up, a lot of people have said, you know, I need my garden to be better. Why don't you know? Yeah, I can go fishing and I can I can go hunting, but I need I need to learn more about gardening because I really want to have a productive garden. If we are totally cut off, um, I want to have be fully self sustainable. So um, that's something that we'll be looking into under our Manaki plan. So helping people get those gardens up and running, making sure they've got the knowledge, um, and we do have a community led training program underway in Tama'upoku at the moment. So we'll be working in with that program to um, get tutors in or just finding ways to share the knowledge, uh, especially having that focus on Māori traditions um, like maramataka, you know, living life by the moon, um, keeping up your health. Yeah, sort of, I guess a lot of people have talked about returning to the old ways. So we're really looking forward to that. Um, same, uh, yeah, with regards to keeping the contact, we created a newsletter post-COVID um, and we've decided to, yeah, keep that up. And that was just, I might just see if I can take you to our website. Can you guys see this page? It's a web page. Can you guys see that? Yes. I yes. So this is our website. Oh. Um, I can, sorry, no, I can just see the slideshow. Oh, okay. So I need to press this other button. And how do I do that? I feel like that. Screen sharing. Oh. oh, well, anyway, never mind. On you share. 
Sorry, guys. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Just taking you to our website. Can you see our website now? There's a picture of Wookie on there. Yep. Cool. So um, if ever you want to know more about what we do, this is our website. On here, if you look under emergency plans, you'll see an example of what um, our emergency plans look like. But I was bringing you here for a reason, which was to show you, I think my internet's a bit slow. Oh, these are the emergency plans. But was just to show you our community newsletter. And we did this post COVID to reassure our people that that we weren't doing nothing <laughs> while we were in lockdown um, to remind people that we want the ideas and um, you know we want to keep up to date with with what they want to do and what they want to see in their community so we received heaps of um, really positive feedback uh, from the people living um, in Tama'upuko about this this newsletter um, you know just updates from the kura from the school um, it's amazing the power of our tamariki and our children and how much that really lifts people up. Um, just seeing what they've been up to, especially our elderly loved it. The training program that we're running um, up in Tamaupoko. And just having this, this newsletter and reminding people, hey, there's so much happening. You know, don't, don't let this COVID-19 stuff get you down, you know, because there's, there's heaps of stuff that's really cool stuff that has been happening and we've got heaps of cool stuff on the horizon. So, um, we'll, yeah, um, I agree with the other speakers when they're talking about keeping the, the act of communication. So, yeah, I think that's about us. Um, yeah, pretty much we're, yeah, keen to just um, progress and uh, move into our... Um, recovery mode, our Manaki plan, and increasing our uh, resilience. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, you for that great presentation. I've just popped the website into the chat if anyone wants to go out after the after this session and have a bit more of a look at, look at the website and see everything they're up to. And as I said, I think in the chat before, hopefully we're going to be able to get everyone's slides and email them out to everyone who registered. For the session today so if you want to go back in and have a look at anything that should definitely be possible so because we're doing unconference style and we want to keep it very um, participatory we thought we might um, break out go into breakout rooms we've got a bit of time up our sleeve we've still got about half an hour left so um, what we thought we'd do is we'd get everyone into breakout rooms for about 10 minutes and then we'd all come back and I think that might give some time for our more reflective thinkers to, to get their questions ready for our panel as well. So we're just going to, I'm going to get my IT guy, Nathan, to just, it'll just automatically put you into a breakout room. And what I'd like you guys to, we well, can discuss whatever you want, but my suggestion would be to maybe share what's top of mind for you coming from this presentation. Perhaps you've got your own COVID community experiences that you want to share. Or perhaps you just want to discuss some questions you want to put to the panel when we when we come back together. So I hope that's okay for everybody. Yep. So Nathan, could I get you to do the magic <laughs> next year, Dean? Next year. Um, I just one thing that came out of our chat room, and I'm just going to make it the first question to the panel, and then if the rest of you can then add your questions in the chat, we'll try and get to a few of those. Is um, the question we had just before we left from Martha was, what is the legacy of COVID for your community? Who would like to pick up that one? Alan, Jess? I guess, um, that's a good question. I guess the, the legacy for our community, I guess, is, is just the, the connections and how, um, how critical it is to be continuing working together so closely because there were, you know, during COVID, there were people we were hoping to connect with prior to COVID actually happening that we couldn't connect to because they were so busy doing this, you know, the mahi on the ground. And, you know, then we were actually able to connect and have those rich connections. So, you know, the legacy is, you know, I guess for us, it's just um, really the, the rich connections that have been established and maintaining them and um, what, you know, what force we can be, you know, if we collectively work together. 
something to add, Jess? Um, pretty much what Ellen just said is, um, it showed the strength of our existing relationships, but gave us the opportunity to build new ones and um, to foster and strengthen those moving forward to um, ensure that we can keep doing what we do for the um, greater good of our community, really. I've just had a message from Shiv that she's had to go to a midwife appointment. So um, I just want to say thank you so much for jumping on board to share with us. It's such an interesting community and very different, obviously, to the ones that those of us that live in huge cities <laughs> live in with just 200 people across the four settlements up the river. So thanks, Shiv, for joining us. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm losing my IT guy. He's going off to set up the next session, but we've definitely got some time for questions. And I think I'm going to be able to play the video from John McKnight as well. But um, does anyone have a question that they would like to share? I know, Roger, you had some questions before about working across larger communities and Hilton had a question about private engaging with the private sector. Hilton, would you like to ask your question to the panel that's sure. still here? Sure, thanks everyone. Um, yeah, so I work in contexts where um, often uh, government is quite weak or governance is quite weak. And so the private sector has to play an increasingly important role um, but what I was saying to our group is that in those contexts you have, you're dealing with very unequal power relations um, and you often come out of a very needs-based kind of narrative on, you know, what does the community need? And, you know, it's almost like a CSR kind of a approach. And so I guess, um, you know, I just want to understand from the speakers a little bit about what COVID has taught us about how the private sector can be engaged in a different way to understand the importance of collaboration and kind of uh, the, the, you know, how, how to engage at the community level and potentially what the ideas are to, to sustain that um, going forward, you know, making sure that collaboration and kind of mutual benefit, a bit more equal power sharing is, is something to, to, to keep investing in. Um. Hi, Hilton. Yeah, Alan here from the Community Centre in Katikati. Uh, just just um, your question about the private sector. I think before COVID, we started engaging a lot with um, our private sector in terms of sponsorship because it's not something we've actually looked into the past. The community centre has been heavily reliant on grants, um, fundraising, etc. Um, and w with those sponsorship and the relationships we had with the private sector, as we went into COVID, it was great because we, we were, you know, keeping that communication with them and we had Hume Packing Call, which is a local pack house um, here and they were, you know, they were seeing the work that we're doing and say, oh, look, how can we help? Can we offer, you know, kiwi fruit to um, our produce store, which we have at the community centre or is anything that we can do play a part in it? So um, we didn't, we only had a small sector that we were involved with in the private sector, but I can see the, the benefits of that collaboration, how they can support social sector and vice versa, you know, we can support each other, um, not just, you know, one or the other. So, um, no, good question. and something that we're here yeah, the community is looking at um, engaging more in the future. Mm. How about you, Marie or Jess, something from Ramwick Park? Um, we, I mean, we're in a unique position in terms of we're in partnership with the state sector. But what I have seen is um, the private sector really rallying with BBM who deliver the program, one of the programs. And um, they were featured on one of the new shows last week about having the largest food bank in Auckland. And that was through um, tapping into their networks and approaching a, a whole host of companies who donated and they got pallets and pallets and pallets of food from um, not just private companies, but also council who had a leftover from the COVID response. Um, so there, there seems to be some groups who have more interactions with the private sector. I mean, Steve Farrelly, who does our breakfast club, some of his sourcing is from the private sector. But we haven't had to do that per se um, in our work. 
Yeah, I'll, just to share an example from the suburb I work in, which is Sandringham in Auckland. It's a much more kind of central, a higher socioeconomic area than where Jess and Maria are coming from. Though it is very diverse, its main feature is there's a very strong Indian identity within the village. So I reckon 80 to 90% of the shops in the village are Indian restaurants. It's an amazing place to get the feed, <laughs> to get a delicious feed. And what I saw happening there just very organically is a lot of the restaurants were offering free food to people in need. And this is actually something that has happened on and off before COVID, but particularly once they're allowed to open, because they had four weeks where they were completely shut. Um, as soon as they reopened, obviously they had their own struggles, but one of them brought out a whole menu with lower prices for everybody and um, Paradise, which is always, um, that was Satya, and Paradise has often had a free food giveaway. So that's something that the local businesses have done. And just generally within New Zealand, certainly Auckland, there's been a lot of encouragement for, for people to shop local and support their local shops. They all had to close during our lockdown, no butchers, no bakers. It was all just done through the big supermarkets, which as a community person, I wasn't so keen on, though I understand the government reasons, it was just to reduce the spread and the number of places we all went to to get our food. Um, yeah, so that's something I saw of the private sector of its own accord. And now New Zealand is trying in return to support small businesses. So we're buying from the small guys, not doing all our internet shopping, not buying from the bigger kind of multinational companies that are in New Zealand, because a lot of our biggest shops are not even owned in New Zealand. We have a lot of Australian businesses over here. So that's something I noticed from an urban context. There are so many great questions. Um, Maria, do you want to ask? You've had a couple of questions. Maria, Christina, do you want to ask a question? Yeah, we in 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 Canada we've we've seen a lot of food waste, and we've seen a lot of of COVID um, health problems in mega, um, you know, factory farms. So I'm just curious about how much COVID has revealed about everybody else's food systems. That's my question. Um, it's Marie here from Randwick. Um, I think for us, food, because, because there are a lot that are already struggling to get um, food, that was one of our main things that we sort of went for. Um, the seed community did some wonderful get together of all the market gardens and the, the things that they had because they work so hard here and they got things together and they just it, it really was a drive-through supermarket it was absolutely incredible but it wasn't just for their community it was very much for everybody and you appreciated the fact that actually they are part of New Zealand and they do some amazing things in our area. Uh, but there, there are a lot of people who couldn't get out to a supermarket or um, if they were told they had to be in isolation, if, if it was even, you know, they couldn't send anyone out. It was like, well, how, how do I get food now? Because I can't get anyone to get it for me. So just that, I guess the reality for me of people who who didn't have access to stuff like that, but also a huge amount of sharing from those that did have stuff. So um, I guess it's what you have, right? <laughs> and you use what you have. And yeah, we were able to look at it and, and see what our families needed. And a lot of our families are, are big families. And so, you know, one meal <laughs> isn't just, you know, something small. They actually need quite a bit of food. But um, we, I mean, we did see things go to waste here in New Zealand, but I think they were able to divert it and to help others out, which, which is such a Kiwi way to work anyway. Hope that helps. Mm. Hi, all. Sorry, I'm just going to jump in. Uh, Nathan Cross here. I'm hosting the, the, the chat just now. Um, Unfortunately, we have another, well, not unfortunately, we have another module starting up in about five, ten minutes' time, and I can't start that group for our hosts to have their little pre-thing until this one wraps up. So I'm just giving a, like a couple of minute warning for any final comments, Then I'm going to have to close this chat so we can let the next people jump on. Thanks.
Thanks, everybody. So, um, so many great questions, and I'm so interested in the food system, but we probably don't have time to cover too much more today yet. Yeah, definitely, just seeing the chat, we really rely on seasonal workers in New Zealand. A lot of them are immigrants, temporary immigrants. They come from the Pacific Islands, go back. So, that's been a huge issue. And obviously, the supermarkets did struggle. I don't think people realised how much small business supplies our food. And when it all got put onto the supermarkets, they couldn't fully cope, though they did, did a good job the best they could. Um, I just want to say a huge thanks to our panel members and give them all a clap for giving up their time. Um, it's been such great learning and we're going to be able to share the slides, which is awesome. Um, the next session after this that Nathan was referring to is about youth. So we've got some Kiwi people on that. It's for youth, by youth, how to engage youth, which is always one of our challenges, I know, working in community. Um, and then tomorrow morning at the same time as this session, there's a great, um, we're looking at how government uses ABCD within New Zealand, which I think is would be of interest to people because obviously government equals funding for a lot of us. So how can they fund us but still be true to ABCD values and philosophy? And following that, the last New Zealand session is an hour with a social entrepreneur who does work in the food space. Um, he set up a social enterprise uh, uh, urban market garden working with refugee and migrant women supplying local cafes. So, so, and that's just the New Zealand sessions, loads more. So thank you very much for joining. I hope to see you all again. We'll get that um, video from John McKnight up somewhere so you can um, have a look. Sorry, we've run out of time to show it to you, even though I think I've got it to work now. Um, and I might try and share it via tweet as well. So just a big thanks from me and a thank you to everyone. And um, we were going to have a checkout, but we've probably run out of time. But I do hope the checkout question was, what's one thing you'll take away and share? So I hope you've all found something you can share with others from this session. And I hope to see you at future sessions. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you, Jessica. Thank, Thank you, Joanne. Uh, Fantastic. Great, 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 great conversations. Bye. Yeah.